I'm going to sort of rush through uh, basically talking to you about research on teaching science in technical subjects more effectively at university level that what we know how to do, and then a little bit on institutional change, changing higher uh, institutions on how they teach, with the kind of underlying idea here that the opportunities and uh, and sort of directions of how to make big changes at the university are actually considerably better and clearer than at the school levels, but also I think a sort of an essential first step because you have to give those, in science, you have to give those future teachers a better understanding of science and how it's taught if you're going to expect them to be able to teach effectively. Uh, and I'm just going to focus on the learning of science and, uh, as thinking like scientists because what I've already told you is how I see that you know, creative thinking and critical thinking is kind of a fundamental integral part of those. So basically this comes from a, a is largely based on a relatively new area of uh, kind of research, discipline-based education research that some of you may be familiar with, but I'm sure uh, others aren't. And this is really uh, studies done by science and engineering faculty members in those departments um, doing research on the teaching and learning of their subjects, chemistry, physics, uh, et cetera. It's work that's, as I said, it's fairly recent. And it's primarily been limited to North America, although now it's starting to spread throughout the world. And we also are seeing more and more connections with basic cognitive psychology in this work. And so the, if it, you look at sort of the overview of all this research that's been done, and you strip away all the fancy labels and jargon, the basic uh, research program, uh, experiments is, the, is basically starting out with developing a test of how well students are learning to think like, i.e., in my way, make decisions like an expert in the subject about the topic that's being covered. Um, and then the, you go and use that instrument to measure the comparison of two different teaching methods uh, that most of the time, the control is the pervasive standard lecture method where the instructor is standing up telling the students what they should think or what they should do. And then the, the intervention is various forms of really having students actively practicing uh, making decisions with frequent feedback from the instructor during the, this is during the classroom session. Um, so, I was able to trace down a couple of years ago something close to a thousand uh, different studies like this over STEM, and basically they show consistently, you know, greater learning from the experimental and lower dropout and failure rates, and so uh, and and quite large effects. And so, since most of you are involved in more in school than at the post-secondary level. Um, I want to say something about how it relates to research, because these two research communities live uh, very largely totally separate and oblivious to each other's work. Um, and the first thing is that the school research turns out to be much harder than this kind of research at the university level. And it's just because there, at the school level, you just have many more confounding variables. You have a much more selective, controlled environment, frankly, in, a, in university classes. And as a result of that, at the school level, you, you can't get nearly as clean and definitive results as you can in the, in the more clean, uh, you know, controlled environment at the university. But the basic principles and the ones I'm going to talk about almost certainly apply there, but they may not be the whole story uh, because there are other factors going on in the way they are at the universities. So I'm going to start. So what have we learned? Well, at the highest level, really, it's a new paradigm for thinking about learning, frankly. Um, and the old and, frankly, current model at essentially every university about learning is that these student brains come into their classrooms and uh, 
university instructors then immerse those brains in knowledge and it soaks in to varying amounts depending on the condition the brain started with, okay? Now, if this is your model of learning, then what you focus on, and if you look at every university I've seen, this is their focus, is, is first, you know, what's the, what's the contents of the knowledge soup, i.e. the curriculum you're gonna, you know, expose those brains to, um, and selecting for the, the best brains that are gonna suck, absorb the soup in the most effective way. And then, when things don't work very well, blaming school for the, any failures, of course. Um, now, what research tells us is really a very different view about learning. Namely, the brains come in and they're not really all that different, but in the educational process, those brains are really transformed. And it, I, I mean that really quite literally. There's, there's different neurons, but most, of, most importantly, very different wiring, how the neurons are hooked together. And that's, those changes that come as, as a result of intense thinking. That's what the brain does. And it's really in this rewired brain that these improved capabilities lie. Now, we actually can even see this uh, with, or the right people can see this, with modern brain imaging. And this is an example of two people in an MRI machine looking, interpreting a medical x-ray. And on your uh, right is the image of the brain of a medical student who's just learning how to do this. On the left is a tr you know, highly experienced expert radiologist interpreting those. And you can actually see how their brains are being activated in very different ways as a result. There are a few studies that actually even take an individual and can track how their brains look, act differently as a, a, over a learning process. So the other thing I'll say is that this also, the research makes the case that it's really the teaching methods that dominate over the curriculum or topics, just because it's the teaching that really determines, you know, how the brain's gonna be exercised and therefore how that's what really affects the neuron uh, pathways. Okay, so that's the big picture. Now I'm gonna just give you a couple of quick examples of the kind of research that uh, is done and the kind of results one sees in these fields. Uh, this is looking at, you know, comparing the teaching of physics and large classes, taking a very big class and having two s large sections of it. And one of those sections is taught the control. It's taught by someone who's a very experienced uh, instructor with good student ratings, but used a traditional lecture approach. And then the experimental approach is, uh, is taught by someone who's been trained in these principles and methods of research-based teaching in my program. And so they agree to cover the same material in the same um, amount of class time. And then they have a jointly developed exam that they give us a surprise quiz right after the, the coverage here. And this is to probe intentionally just the learning that took place from going to class, okay? Um, so this is the histogram as the result of, the, uh, of this test. And uh, you can see pretty dramatic differences. Now, in fact, on this test, the learning is really how far above three they are. And so if you look at it from that perspective, you realize how tiny the actual learning from lecture is. And I've seen other data that shows similar things. But also, importantly, that this is clearly better for all the students. The entire distribution has moved up, showing that it's basically, you know, not selective at all the population. Now, you might argue correctly, well, that's just in class, lots of learning takes place outside of the classroom. And in fact, most of the research looks at, the, at how much students learn over the course of an entire, uh, you know, semester term. And Here's an example of that where it's taking uh, the first year physics and looking at how well students are, are able to think like a physicist in terms of applying the basic concepts of force and motion covered in this class to make predictions about what's gonna happen in simple real world situations. So researchers have developed a good test for this 
in this case, they have, we have a lot of different, or in their case, they have a lot of different instructors in small sections. They collected data over a number of years. And in this test, they all scattered around 0.3. That's a pretty typical number for this kind of teaching um, in this material. Then they switched to the you know, research-based teaching methods. And basically, all the, the learning and all the different sections, all the instructors jumped up is now on a, they scatter around about a factor of two higher than it was before, okay? Um, again, this makes the point you have the same instructors simply using different, better teaching methods, and that really dominated the learning of what the students have. Uh, just to show you, it's not all physics. This is from uh, computer science. Again, four instructors teaching this four core courses. They switched to these uh, research-based teaching methods. They looked at the failure rates and they dropped dramatically across the board. Again, you have the same people simply adopting better teaching methods and they now have a failure rate at UC San Diego uh, about a factor of uh, three what it, uh, or a third what it used to be in these core uh, entry-level computer science courses. So what's happening in these? I, you know, to try and give it as quickly as I can a summary, that basically in these experimental courses, you have the students do a little bit of advanced preparation, and then the class time is really them working on solving carefully prepared problems, you know, working out the answers, usually interacting with other students in a great big lecture theater, be their neighbors in terms of discussing and solving these. While they're doing that, the instructor is going around monitoring their thinking and learning, and then periodically, every 10 minutes or so, is then giving overall feedback to the whole class and answering questions, and then the students will continue on through the next part of the problem throughout the, the class period. But that's, that's the big picture. We, the research shows a lot of factors are important to actually make this work, and uh, mo most effectively, and so, this is sort of my summary of everything the research no says about teaching science at the university level. It's important. In the middle here is what I've said. They, they have to be practicing actively making decisions with good guiding feedback on their, you know, to help them improve. But the design of, of the task there really needs to include all of these factors, the motivation, the right level for their prior knowledge, some constraints about the brain, and then the disciplinary expertise. That's kind of what I was talking about yesterday, of making sure that those questions they're figuring out really are involving understanding and using science in an effective way. And then we have research telling us about the, the best way to have the tasks and deliverables and how to optimize the social learning process that they have. So I would argue that the, the really important thing here is, and it's quite novel uh, or recent, this really defines university teaching expertise. And by what I mean by that is, is the use of in, you know, incorporating all of these things is going to improve learning compared to their left out. And if you properly include all of them, you really dominate. There's really very little else left that we see that affects the, the student learning outcomes. Um, and this also means that we can evaluate teaching in a much better way, because we can look to what extent are people actually using these uh, practices effectively, which is way beyond what we do, uh, universities do, evaluating teaching now. So I'm going to just spend the last couple minutes switching gears to talk about this big experiment that I ran in institutional change, how to change a large-scale change at research universities, entire science departments on how they teach to incorporate all of these better teaching methods. And so um, this was a very big project, a lot involved. I ended up having to write a book to cover all of it. You can go read the details. But this changed the teaching of several hundred uh, you know, faculty members and most of the credit hours in science taught at these large research universities. Uh, there was a whole lot that went into the design and execution, but just a very 
surface level, and involved substantial competitive grant programs to departments, and most of that money went to them. Some went to faculty incentives, but most of it went to actually hiring department education specialists that then worked in the department in with faculty in the department to transform their courses and how they taught and their understanding of teaching. And so just a quick summary of the important results of this are we found, okay, so large scale change is possible. It wasn't universal, but we have multiple departments where we have over 90% of the faculty have completely changed their teaching. Um, probably a more important result is we found that once faculty learn to teach this way, and it does take a significant investment of time, but they greatly prefer it to the traditional lecture. And so these hundreds, virtually none of them have actually gone back now to, to lecturing. They all say, oh, I never want to do that. Uh, and it, in terms of instructional costs, it costs the same, but the students are learning more. Um, and, but another important finding is the the, the incentive system, the university incentive system, really opposes, it's a disincentive to adopt these, these teaching methods. It punishes people for this. And so really the critical next step is universities have to, have to recognize, support, and incentivize this idea of teaching expertise in its faculty. And I would just finish with saying, I think the essential next step in this whole process is to come up with a better way of evaluating teaching. And I've written an article on this, I can give you details, but I've laid out what the requirements are, and in particular discussed how the current universal method, which is student instructor evaluations, uh, is really fails badly at capturing good teaching methods and teaching methods that lead to more learning, frankly. Uh, when you look at the research on it at this level. And so, you know, I, we developed a better way to do this, just you can read about it. So uh, with that, I'll just stop and list, here's a few references, you want to learn a lot more about this subject, uh, and I'll make sure my slides are posted.